Area Zero is one of the largest and most mysterious, well, areas of the Paldea region in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Its habitats range from the grassy plains to the rugged hillsides, and from the shallow pools to the dark depths of the cave system in this crater. Area Zero packs over 80 different Pokemon in it, but what do they all eat and how do they interact with each other? Let's make a Pokemon food web here at Geek Ecology where we discuss the biology and ecology of made up organisms. Like most other food webs, both in the natural world and in made up worlds, this one is going to start with the sun that is going to provide energy to our producers. Most of our producers are found in the highest parts of Area Zero before we get down to the darker depths of the Area Zero crater or cave system. These producers are mainly grasses with the occasional shrub or tree that are found in the grasslands in Area Zero. A few other producers include photosynthetic Pokemon like the grass type Skidoo and Go-Go, as well as the Jump Bluff one. Both of these Pokemon have mouths and presumably digestion systems, so in addition to sunlight, they likely seek out other forms of nutrients. Interestingly enough, Go-Go and Skiddo are likely herbivores, choosing to consume other producers to get the majority of their calories. The Jump Bluff line might be somewhat forgivorous and choose to feed on easy to consume fruits and berries, since the entire line seems to lack any kind of teeth or beak, and probably even jaw muscles while we're at it. One trophic level above our producers are our primary consumers, otherwise known as herbivores. In addition to our two Pokemon producers also occurring in this level, we have Numel and Camerup eating low-lying plants like grasses, Fanpy, Donphan, Girafferig, and Farigaraff browsing on shrubs and trees, Hippopotas and Hippowdon are going to be foraging for roots and tubers found underneath the soil. The Palmy line, as well as Chansey and Raichu, are focusing on seeds and fruit. Low Kicks, eating any plant material it can come across, basically. And finally, the lines of Volcarona, Venomoth, Frostmoth, and Masquerain feeding on leafy vegetation or the nectar from flowering plants. This group of Pokemon is based off modern day Lepidopterans like moths and butterflies, for the most part. Masquerain is kind of like a combo of a pond skimmer with its pre-evolution Surskit and various Lepidopterans and Dragonflies with its affinity for water, buzzy flight, and large ice bots used to scare away predators. However, none of these Pokemon have a proboscis like you would see on a Nectarivorous butterfly, so it's possible that they have other feeding habits. Venomoth may even be somewhat predatory with its pincer-like jaws. More research is needed. Another interesting addition to this trophic level is Floet. Instead of physically consuming parts of the plants like real-world organisms do, Pokemon have the ability to essentially drain the life force out of living organisms. This is most often seen in ghost types, but moves like Absorb and Giga Drain seem incredibly similar. Floet's Pokedex entry states that it draws out the power of flowers to battle. And if you can harness it to battle, why not harness it to keep yourself alive as well? It is interesting to note that Floet does not learn any of the life-draining moves like Absorb, and instead only learns plant manipulation moves like Razor Leaf and Petal Dance. However, it also learns Synthesis and Solar Beam, which are both moves that rely on the ability to draw energy from the sun. The more I research Floet, the more that it seems like a plant parasite where it lets the plant do all the work, and then Floet just reaps the rewards. But it doesn't want to straight up consume its plant hosts, which is in contrast to most herbivores. Instead, Floet essentially practices agriculture, making sure that its patch of flowers are nice and healthy, so that it has plenty of host plants to latch onto should it need to store up more energy to evolve. And finally, we have some of our most important herbivores of any food web, which are going to be our invertebrates and our small rodents. Most of the invertebrates are going to be insects, and rodents are going to be things like mice that help keep plants in check and won't take over the environment. And they also provide a large food source for our upcoming predators. Feeding on our herbivores are going to be our first predators, which are also known as secondary consumers. And among these are many omnivores whose diet is made up of plant materials and animals or Pokemon. These Pokemon are Metatite and Metacham, having dexterous hands for picking and processing fruits, while also lacking the jaw anatomy to spend all day chewing on grasses. If they were to feed on these tougher plants that require a lot of chewing, you would expect larger jaw muscles like you would see in cows, and instead they have reduced jaw muscles like you see in humans. They likely also feed on invertebrates should they encounter any like modern primates, catching arboreal insects or feeding on termite mounts. A few of our bird Pokemon are also omnivores as they have fairly generalized beaks and include Altaria and Swablu in the Espatra line. These Pokemon are probably focusing on grains and fruits, but will eat small bug types and insects should they come across any. In fact, invertebrates are going to be the main diet for many of the Pokemon found in this crater. 
including Diglett and Dugtrio, as well as Dunsparce and Dedunsparce, having a diet similar to modern day moles and fossorial snakes in that they eat subterranean invertebrates such as worms, ants, and grubs. Two Pokemon eating invertebrates in the air instead of in the ground are Glimet and Glamora. These Pokemon only exist in the deeper cave systems of Area Zero and mostly attach themselves to the cave walls and act like some kind of terrestrial coral, filter feeding on prey and other nutrients out of the air. Given Glomet's Pokedex entry and that they are rock types, they also probably obtain minerals from the cave walls and might even slowly break them down to form their hard exoskeletons. Sabline might also have a similar diet as it has fairly simple homodont teeth. Its Pokedex entry states that it eats gemstones and rocks, as well as Pokemon like Carbane. But one would expect its jaw morphology and dentition to be drastically different if it relied on crushing hard objects in order to feed. However, its teeth are much more similar to obligate carnivores like cats or sharks, things that eat only fairly soft-bodied animals. In real life, consuming crystals and rocks wouldn't really provide any calories, but Area Zero might provide the sabli of this ecosystem with an interesting source of energy. Crystals are often portrayed as having magical properties in basically every fantasy setting and Pokemon is no different, especially in Area Zero where the crystals here are linked to the terrestrial phenomenon. Sabli being part ghost type, a type that specializes in draining the life force out of its victims, might be able to drain some kind of magical energy right out of the crystals themselves to help supplement its caloric needs. Otherwise, I imagine Sabli acting exactly like Gollum from Lord of the Rings, where it's just kind of scampering around and eating raw fish and digging in the dirt for worms and muttering under its breath like, Stupid tricks and gabites. Halucha and Talonflame might also fit in this trophic level, easily catching insects on the wing, but also having the combat prowess to take down some of the more dangerous bug types found here. Halucha is an ambush predator that takes advantage of the crater's steep cliffs in order to get the jump on its prey, and whereas Talonflame is incredibly ecologically similar to the modern day firehawks of Australia. This group of hawks have been observed deliberately picking up burning sticks in order to spread fires and flush out prey. Talonflame has the advantage as it doesn't have to wait for a fire to occur, and instead can start the arson all by itself to scare out bug types from the grasslands of Area Zero. Espeon and Sneasel, being weak to bug types, are instead going to focus on small mammal-like Pokemon like Raichu and the Palmy line. They may be important predators keeping these populations of electric rodents in line, since their typing might be enough to deter this area's many predatory birds. I even have a whole video on that subject if you want to give it a watch. In addition to rodents, Sneasel occasionally hunts cooperatively and is able to raid the nests of much larger Pokemon, including our larger mammalian-like herbivores, as well as the bird Pokemon of Area Zero. This trophic level is also home to a variety of aquatic fauna, like fish and aquatic insects, that are found in the waterways and shallow pools of Area Zero. Most of these organisms are going to be feeding on invertebrates, and in turn are being eaten by the first members of our tertiary consumers, Golduck, Vaporeon, Flamigo, and even possibly Ponyard and Bisharp. This line's Pokedex entries state that they sharpen their blades on rocks found near rivers. This isn't exactly the same as saying that they eat fish, but if they are already inhabiting that environment to find appropriate sharpening stones, I would think these highly social and intelligent Pokemon would take advantage of easy to catch aquatic prey. Using pack hunting techniques and their generally dangerous limbs, they are also hunting larger game like our mammal-like herbivorous Pokemon. This trophic level also belongs to the rest of our predatory bird-like Pokemon of Braviary and Corviknight. These flying types are incredibly large, especially for things resembling birds, and likely can prey on most Pokemon found in the grassland and forest habitats of this area. Braviary might be slightly more carnivorous, as its hooked beak is similar to modern-day hyper-carnivorous raptors and might prefer our mammal-like herbivores. Corviknight is slightly larger, but has a beak more suited for a generalist. It lacks the hooked beak of raptors and instead has a beak well-equipped to handle a variety of prey items and food sources. Corviknight certainly has the size and strength to take down Pokemon like Dunsparce or even Sneasel, but it also may rely largely on fruits and seeds. I believe that this herbivorous-centric diet is supported through Corviknight's use of a flying taxi in the Galar region. Most domesticated animals, particularly those used as work animals, are herbivorous or at least omnivorous like Corviknight. A plant-based diet would allow Corviknight trainers a much cheaper and easier to obtain diet for their large flying steeds instead of having to constantly source meat. Like, imagine if you had to feed your horse a T-bone steak instead of just letting it out in a field. Not only does that sound like the basis for a terrible horror movie, but the cost would quickly add up. Our last surface-level predators are the two forms of Lycanroc that prowl Area Zero. 
Having both a diurnal and nocturnal form, these rock-type carnivores would make quick work of weaker herbivores. Type matchups may play an important role here, as I'm pretty sure that Fampi, Hippopotas, Skiddo, and Numal would taste delicious, but they still do have a type advantage. This may cause Lycan Rock to select for Pokemon such as Girafferig or Chansey, or possibly even smaller prey such as the Palmyon. However, this weakness may be compensated for by Lycan Rock Midday's propensity to form packs and Lycan Rock Midnight's nocturnal hunting. More observations in the field are required. Now, moving into the cave systems of Area Zero, we have a surprising amount of predators, and that is one of my biggest gripes in route or area design in the Pokemon games. Predator Pokemon usually have that cool edge to them and are oftentimes competitive powerhouses, but they really don't set up their zones with ecology in mind. Which is totally fair, this is a video game, but that's where my mind goes when I look at all these Pokemon in a route. Like, if we have all these giant predators but no producer or herbivores, what are they all going to eat? You can only say so many Pokemon eat rocks before it gets kind of old. But let's try and finish this food web out with our subterranean predators. First up is the Garganical line. Garganical itself has some pretty wholesome Pokedex entries, seeing that it heals the wounds of Pokemon using its salt. But its previous evolution, Nacklestack, has pretty much the exact opposite, instead stating that it dry cures its prey using its salt. It's possible that the Garganical line undergoes an ontogenetic shift in its diet by only having predatory tendencies in its middle evolution, while finding alternative sources of energy once it's fully evolved, or it specializes in one prey source while ignoring all other Pokemon that it could potentially consume. If you're a Garganical trainer, let me know what you feel. Next up, we have our Dragon Pokemon with Gibble and Gabite, preferring fossorial prey like Diglett, thanks to their ground typing. And Dino and Zwilus might be somewhat similar to bats, leaving their caves only at night to wander the grasslands of Area Zero, hoping to snatch up any prey that gets close to their mini mounds. And I even have a whole video dedicated to the ecology and biology of the High Dragon line if you want to check that out. Our final dragon type, Dracloak, is a little less straightforward. This line's Pokedex entries say that Dreepy are reborn as a ghost Pokemon. Now, ghost Pokemon in general are pretty hard to explain in a biological sense, but these things, along with all the other ghost Pokemon, are more than just apparitions or spirits since they can interact with their environment, get status conditions, eat berries, and even reproduce. So I see ghost typing as more of a Pokemon's ability to magically vanish or phase through walls than being a specter reborn in a physical body. Many ghost types, like the Gengar line, I take as a kind of modular colonial organism. An organism that is basically made up of millions of microscopic organisms that have organized themselves to form a body and even have different specialized cells to form organs. Think a magical, spooky version of a sea anemone or a Portuguese man o' war, which are both modular colonial organisms. But Dracloak is somewhat different. It has a more specialized body plan than the Gaseous and Blobby Gengar line, and has its design rooted in an ancient amphibian, the Diplocolis. The Pokedex even references this, saying that Dreepy wanders areas that used to be prehistoric seas and bites at Clauncher even though it doesn't currently feed on it, and that this is a vestigial behavior, or a behavior that no longer serves a purpose due to evolution. But looking through the lens of biology, and my personal headcanon I guess, I take this as the Dreepy line has simply evolved from an aquatic ancestor. Maybe one that looked fairly similar but wasn't a ghost type. Dreepy and Dracloak are still heavily associated with aquatic environments, but the fact that they no longer feed on Clauncher makes me think they don't prey on typical aquatic prey. And maybe their current diet has something to do with one of Dreepy's only four moves that it learns before evolving, and that is Infestation. Infestation deals one-eighth of the target's HP per turn, almost like their actual life force is being drained, something we know that Ghost Pokémon love to do. Its other moves focus on ambushing the target with Astonish and Quick Attack, and then holding it in place using Bite with its fairly large jaws. And since Dreepy are so highly associated with Dracloaks and Dragapults, it's possible that once this life force is drained, they bring some back to feed their parents. This is pretty much the opposite of every other parent-child relationship, but may support the idea that these Pokémon have somehow evolved into a modular colonial organism from an amphibian-like ancestor and Dreepy is simply an extension of Dracloak or Dragapult's body, kind of like a detachable flying version of a Man of War's tentacles. All this is to say that maybe Dragcloak waits an ambush in the waters of Area Zero waiting for prey, or hosts, to get a drink of water before appearing and firing their Dreepy to suck the life force from whatever Pokémon is thirsty and unlucky enough to cross its path. 
I didn't really intend to get so deep into the ecology of Dreepy in this video, but the more I looked into it, the more I kept rolling. So let me know what you think of this hypothesis and if it made any sense. Finally, I think that Dry Cloak and Dreepy, along with Corviknight, fit into our Detritivore category quite nicely. These are organisms that help consume or break down decaying organisms. Think scavengers or things like fungus in the real world. Our two dragons here might feast on any remaining life force left in deceased Pokemon, and Corviknight would have no problem picking apart carcasses much like real world ravens and crows. Except now they're enormous and made of metal. And now finally this leaves us with a completed food web for Area Zero. Except we're missing kind of one of the most interesting parts of Area Zero, which are our Paradox Pokemon. We don't really know the story of Paradox Pokemon, but from everything we can tell, they appear to be living, breathing organisms, so they probably need energy and things to eat. Some of our Paradox forms seem to fit in pretty well with their regular forms, like Slitherwing and Iron Moth probably filling a similar niche as Volcarona. And we have our two Donphan forms of Great Tusk and Iron Treads, still able to use their elongated and flexible noses to reach brows that other Pokemon might be unable to reach. However, Great Tusk's dentition is kind of suspicious for a Pokemon that otherwise has a very herbivorous inspired design. If Great Tusk were still an herbivore, like Donphan, we would expect to see flat, wide teeth capable of chewing and grinding down the plant material it feeds on. Instead, we are faced with an organism that has the body plan of an herbivore, but the dentition of an obligate carnivore. Carnivores commonly have homodont dentition, like we spoke of earlier, meaning that all their teeth are similar because they mostly rely on cutting off chunks of flesh and dispatching prey instead of chewing on leaves for hours. Great Tusk, besides its tusks, which are modified teeth and can be even seen originating from the top jaw, has only simple jagged teeth like a shark or a crocodilian. Does it use its ground typing to unearth Diglett before snatching them up and swallowing them whole? Or maybe it tears off chunks of Chansey meat after using some fighting type moves. In summation, I'm not really quite sure where to place this Pokemon, but I am sure that I can't trust it. I'm placing Iron Jugulus and Roaring Moon, similar to Dino and Zwilus, as obligate carnivores. Iron Hands, Iron Thorns, Iron Valiant, and even Screamtail I'm classifying as omnivores. Iron Hands I could see using its large iron hands, to dig for roots and tubers, or using its electric typing to stun fish to snatch up. Iron Thorns and Valiant are both strong enough to take down large prey, but likely have an omnivorous diet if they are anything like their modern counterparts. Brute Bonnet might be another detritivore like its fungi-like cousins, but this form may be bullying predators off their kills and consuming meat using its sharp teeth, instead of breaking down plant material like Amoongus. Another Detritivore might be Fluttermane, using its ghost attacks to sap life energy similar to Dreepy and Dracloak. Like Delibird, Iron Bundle may be foraging for seeds and fruits, and finally, Sandy Shocks may represent another Pokemon that is able to draw energy directly from the crystals in Area Zero, similar to Sablight. This food web is a bit of a mess between trying to fit all the regular Pokemon and the Paradox Pokemon in at the same time, but I think it's a great start to researching all of the bizarre happenings that are going on in Area Zero. Of course, a new DLC or something could be released like tomorrow and completely change our understanding of Paradox Pokemon, but this is my best guess right now. If you enjoyed this Pokemon food web, feel free to check out some of my other Pokemon food webs, and thanks for sticking around for this whole video because this has got to be like the longest video yet. I'm looking forward to another great year of geek ecology, and as always, thanks for watching and happy researching.